All right, next up is boundary conditions. So, um, you know, as we're working our way down the left-hand side, we'll come to the boundary conditions portion where we'll have to tell the solver, like, what's going on on all of these boundaries. Um, so let me first uh, just point out that if you don't specify a boundary condition on any of the faces of your solid, there's what's in finite element uh, method, there's what's called a natural boundary condition, which is what's going to be applied by default. The natural boundary condition for heat transfer is adiabatic, meaning that there's no heat flux through the boundary. So any surface that I don't click on or I don't explicitly tell it what to do, it's going to treat that as an adiabatic surface, which is actually great. That means that a lot of the times, like there will be a lot of portions of your solid where you won't have to actually specify your boundary conditions. The, um, the only real problem with that is that if you forget to like apply a boundary condition, the simulation will not tell you that you forgot to do it. It'll just treat it as if it's adiabatic. So this is one thing you're going to want to verify when you are done with your simulations is that the boundary conditions look like what you think they were supposed to look like. Um, but that being said, like you can click on the plus sign to apply each individual boundary condition. Um, so you'll kind of get a sense of like what's there's there's five options here and they are exactly what you think they are. So fixed temperature values are you like highlight a surface and tell it what the temperature on that surface is supposed to be. Um, now it says fixed, but actually it doesn't have to be like a single temperature. Um, so actually I so in my um, in our example problem here, let me actually re remind you what our boundary conditions were. So according to my problem definition statement, I really just highlighted, uh, let's see if I can blow this up a little bit. This is too small. Um, I had highlighted two particular boundary conditions. One is that at the upper surface, so like the top of our sphere, I wanted to have a Gaussian laser heating. So this is a heat flux condition. So we're gonna specify the heat flux on the upper portion of our bowl, but on the lower portion of our bowl, so like where the distance is like a fixed distance, so that's like the outer portion of our hemisphere, um, I'm gonna specify that the temperature is zero on those outer boundaries. So there's a that's a location where I have a fixed temperature. So um, those are our only boundary conditions actually. That actually covers all the boundaries of that solid. Um, so that is what I'm going to do. Okay, let me go back to my simulation now. Where was that? Is it this one? Yes. Perfect. Okay, so um, that's a fixed temperature value on the bottom portion. So when I click on the fixed temperature value, it brings up this uh, drop box or this, uh, this little property thing. So when it highlights blue, that means that like it's expecting me to assign a face or a volume or an edge to this condition. In this case, it only makes sense to apply a face to have a fixed temperature value. So I will click on it and it will select it. So uh, it'll even give me like a little helpful, you see this little red thing at the bottom? It's a little helpful sign, like a little call out that says that this is a temperature boundary condition. So um, I wanted my boundary condition to be that the temperature was zero. So I will manually override the temperature value. Um, and when you're done, you can click save. Uh, before I do that though, let me point out a couple other things that are down here. You'll see like a little thing here that's for a table and another one for a formula. If you click on formula, you can actually specify like a temperature that varies in space. So like I can create a formula that depends on X, Y, and Z. And if you have a transient simulation, you can even create one that depends on time, which is pretty cool. Um, so there's like a bunch of choices here. Um, what else did I want to say about that? I think that I think that's it. I'll show you an example of this when I like using a formula when I go to do the heat flux condition on the top. But for now, we're just going to use a fixed like constant temperature value of zero, and then let's do the next boundary condition. So um, it, it's interesting that they do this in this order. A cyclic boundary condition or a cyclic symmetry is basically a translational symmetry. We don't have one of those in this problem. Like it's, imagine that I have like, you know, imagine that I have a cylinder where like one face of the cylinder 
represents like what would like the beginning of the other portion you can create like sort of periodic boundary conditions that way it's like a little trick to be, create periodic boundary conditions um, it's a little bit more uh, exclusive than periodic boundary conditions because like when it's cyclic it's not just the heat flux that goes across the boundary it's also like the temperature is equal on the two sides um, let's see what about Okay, surface heat flux is, is the one that we actually have here. So um, in our actual problem, I was gonna say that like there's a Gaussian laser that's spread across the top surface. Now note that there are two faces here, an inner one and an outer one. So I should select both because actually the Gaussian laser is actually spread beyond where that first circle is. Um, so I'll click both of those to select both those surfaces. And in this case, I want my heat flux value to be given by a formula. So I'll click on the formula. Now, what was my formula? My formula was, let's come back here. It was 2 point, so the heat flux should be 2.54 in whatever SI units are, times e to the minus 8 times r squared, where r squared is the cylindrical like coordinate. Now note that R does not appear here, so I actually have to create R myself. So here's what I'll do. Um, so what I say was 2.54? Yeah, 2.54 times E to the minus, I think you have to, I think I tried doing this once. You have to do like minus one times R squared, which is X, squared plus y squared so that's our r value and then divided by oh no i'm sorry what did i do that should be eight out in the front right 8.0 um so like i can create like a simple formula like that if you type in something wrong that it doesn't like it'll tell you there's an issue with your formula. So I put an underscore here, and now it'll tell me there's some issue with my formula. So if I get rid of it and apply it, boom. Now I've got a um, Gaussian beam on, like applied to the top of my, uh, my simulation box. So for this simulation, those are the only boundary conditions that actually exist. Um, you can actually create a convective heat flux as well. Um, so this is like the H value. You can specify um, either a constant H value, or again, you can input a formula for how that varies with space. This is really useful, for example, if you have like a flow over like a plate or an airfoil, where the heat transfer coefficient might be a lot bigger on the leading edge than it is on the trailing edge. So like for laminar boundary layers, the um, heat transfer coefficient goes inversely with distance to like the half power or something like that. Um, this is not truly a boundary condition, but like to have internal heat generation um, hidden underneath the boundary conditions is what's called volume heat flux. So like if you wanted to apply a volumetric heat flux to this volume, you would select that, you know, select the body and then assign a value to the volumetric heat flux. And again, like you can use a formula to do that if it's like something that varies in space. So I'm not going to do that because I don't actually have that in this. Let's see, were there any other boundary conditions? No, that's it. That covers all the ones that are available. Um, and again, note that uh, like one of the things that drives me crazy about um, SimScale is that it does not have one for radiation, right? There's like look in here, which one would I use for radiation? Um, in fact, the part of the problem with radiation is that Radiation involves like a heat flux that goes as temperature to the fourth power. That's actually a nonlinear phenomena. So if you want to do radiation, you actually have to turn on the nonlinear solver. Um, I'll try and show you an example of that later. Um, so like you would have to essentially create a surface heat flux that depends on temperature to the fourth power manually. Okay, that's good enough for the boundary conditions. Um, I guess one th one other thing I'll point out, uh, I'm not using it in this example, but if you want to exploit symmetry in a problem, um, symmetry really means that like, you know, basically like 
if I were to slice an object down the middle, the temperature profiles are symmetric about that slice. Um, that, what that really means is that the slope of the temperature has to be zero wherever the two slices connect. Um, so that is actually an adiabatic boundary condition, which is the natural boundary condition. So if you're slicing up your geometry, like I had shown like that you could potentially slice things into a quarter like this, if I had been using this geometry, what I would do for boundary conditions on these two sides is I would just let the natural boundary condition, like the adiabatic boundary condition, be true on these boundaries. So that is actually how you handle symmetry. Um, let me go back to my actual simulation now. So, so we just finished our boundary conditions and we're ready to move on to the other portions.